Okay, I think uh, we're probably going to get started. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, as you know, the topic for today is um, virtual reality and how it may affect the classroom. Um, how many people here are educators? Just so we know who we're talking to. Yeah, okay. There we go. Um, so um, this is uh, this event is put on uh, by Sifa uh, Hollywood's Animation Educators Forum. And if you don't know what that is, um, we have a sign-up list that's going to be going around. So please join the forum. It's a, a collective of educators all over the world um, where we're able to pose questions to each other and solve educational problems. But we also have events uh, three times a year. Once at SIGGRAPH, usually something like this, a birds of the feather. Um, once at CTN, a similar type of thing. And then we have a general membership uh, meeting where we um, have an all-day uh, talk. Um, today, uh, I'm, I'm co-moderating this. My name is Aubrey Mintz. I'm the head of animation at um, California State University, Long Beach. Um, and co my, the co-moderator is um, Lee Crow. Uh, from Cal State Northridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, we are happy to have our panelists today. Um, one of them, unfortunately, could not be here due to a family emergency, um, but we are thrilled to have um, Caleb Owens from California State University Northridge and Eloa Champagne, close? Yeah, perfect. Uh, from uh, the, the technical director at the National Film Board. Is the sound okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, of course, this is a birds of the feather, so we welcome discussion um, as we get rolling. If um, ideas spark, please uh, yell them out, and we'll, we'll keep the conversation going. But first, we're going to have a visual presentation. Uh, Eloy is going to show us um, some work that they've been doing at uh, the National Film Board. Maybe in, in the meantime, uh, we can just do quick introductions sure. and, and tell us about your experience in the VR world. Caleb, do you want to start? Sure. Uh, I am assistant professor over at Cal State Northridge, and my particular focus in the animation department is uh, game development and uh, VR and visual effects. Um, I got 25 plus years of experience in the uh, visual effects, animation, CG industry. Um, VR experience is done a little bit of VR way back when it was first kind of coming out, uh, the other version of it that kind of died. And then in recent years, I've done quite a different uh, variety of projects with VR from, uh, from actually the post-production end to some of the production end. A lot of research more than anything, which is sort of where we're at, I think most of us are at. Um, and so I'm excited to talk to everybody. And anything else you want to know about? Or that cover great. space is great. Um, okay, myself, I'm not a, a, an educator, but as a technical director at the animation studio, uh, I have the chance and privilege to work with all, you know, a lot of creators uh, with different types of animation. Uh, so we still do, you know, painting on glass, we do CG, all types of CG we do. So, uh, and, and that's how we approach VR. It's for us, it's an evolution to things that we've been doing before in a way. Uh, you know, we've been pioneering, pioneering, sorry, my, uh, uh, stereoscopic uh, movies. Uh, McLaren, Lauren McLaren did their first uh, uh, animation, uh, stereoscopic animation in 1951. Uh, we've did a lot of, of stereo films since then. Uh, so VR is a little bit of an evolution of that. It's a new, not that new, but a, another opportunity to tell stories. Uh, so we have uh, already, uh, just at the animation studio, probably five projects in VR, very different. Um, uh, and at the NMB at large, we have documentaries, we have, so we probably have 10 or 15 VR projects uh, on the work at different stages right now. Um, the reason I wanted to talk about Minotaur VR, uh, 
for this panel was um, because this project was a very interesting experience. It started as a stereoscopic movie, traditional you know, film to be projected on, on a large screen. Uh, and it's a project that we eventually turned into a dome project, so a, a, an immersive animation project uh, for a dome. Uh, and then we went ahead and turned that into a VR experience. So this, this whole experience of going from traditional animation, really, to, to a full VR stereoscopic film, um, we learned a lot doing that. We learned a lot about audio. I can talk a little bit about that later. So I just brought a few visuals just to, you know, as a teaser for what the project is. So I'll just go through that real quickly. Uh, so the film is an abstract, linear, stereoscopic VR animation. Linear because it's not interactive. It's not in a game engine. It's, uh, it's in a way, it's a very traditional film concept in that way. Um, but it's fully immersive uh, and, and stereoscopic. That's Film is uh, this mythic story of the hero journey, the different step in in in, uh, in the journey of the hero with the labyrinth, you know, Minotaur, uh, love, uh, death, uh, rebirth. Uh, it's to see it on a screen like that. Even in stereo, the tradition, the, the stereo film was interesting, but. It really, really uh, felt complete as a VR experience. So again, it started as a as a traditional, you know, two K uh, stereoscopic projection. Uh, the software used to make the film is a, a software developed by IMAX and the NFT called Sandy. Uh, it's a stereoscopic animation software. Uh, artists will draw, use Sandy to draw in space uh, uh, with you know, 3D glasses, uh, a magnetic wand, and they, they draw and animate in stereo directly uh, in 3D space. Um, but Sandy wasn't made, was made originally to do dome or, or VR uh, films, so we, we had to modify the software to be able to render uh, for dome. Uh, as a circular map or for uh, Equiria, Equiria Singular 360 uh, stereoscopic uh, rendering. So we went from you know, traditional film to a dome to uh, stereoscopic VR. Um, there's, there was also compositing involved, so we used Nuke and After Effects. And I had to use Maya for some part of it because uh, there were there were things that Cindy didn't handle well. Uh, we have a texture background, uh, and it was impossible to do that in Cindy to have a seamless, to have no seams, a complete sphere uh, with a with a bitmap texture. So I had to use uh, Maya for that. Uh, we also mixed took the original mix. 7.1 mix that we did for the stereoscopic movie and tried to make a specialized uh, VR immersive sound with it. Uh, and it was a very, very interesting experience. So, uh, um, it seemed at first that mixing VR in the theater was something, was a thing, it was feasible. And then we quickly realized that, uh, well, no, it doesn't really work. Uh, you need to mix VR in VR. Um, when you mix in a theater, you mix for the room, you mix with the theater, you don't mix with the experience. Uh, if you're in space, if you're in a, in a specific room, if you're, you need things to sound properly for that space that you have created in VR. Uh, so we are working at Unity right now on ways to mix directly in VR with, you know, try to, to mimic the experience that we do for, for film. 
uh, for a traditional film where we have the mixer, we have the, the filmmaker, we have the, the producer listening and, and working in that space, but in VR in real time. Uh, so the, the mix for that was a 5.1 mix that we specialized. Uh, it wasn't interactive, so it, it doesn't respond to, to our actions, but it does have head tracking in some uh, players. Um, mostly on the Samsung Gear VR. Uh, that's it for that. Thank you. Thank you. I find it interesting that you mixing in VR and you are and drawing animation in VR. Do you find that producing for VR is best done in VR? I think so, definitely. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually, Sandy right now, it's an old software. It's, some, it's a software that we developed with IMAX, but really 15, 20 years ago. It has evolved a little bit, uh, but it's not, it's, we're not working in VR when we work uh, in it. We are working in stereo, though, which helps. Uh, but uh, having a tool that actually work in VR and you're creating in VR is definitely the goal. Uh, and we, we tried some experiment to, to make Sandy capable of doing that, but the software would have to be rewritten quite a bit. Um, and it's not something that we, that we, that we can do uh, right now. Uh, but our goal is definitely to develop a, a tool that can allow creators to, to not only draw in VR, but like, like Tilt Brush, but animate uh, in VR. And animate in different ways. You know, it could be uh, it could be uh, with different rigging system, but uh, to be able to work directly. Yeah. And, and that's definitely the goal. You know, I'm speaking of sort of the creators and how they how their process might have changed in VR. I have some questions for um, Eloi and uh, Caleb. Um, so I watched a uh, TED talk recently from uh, the CEO, Chris Milk, who is a uh, CEO of Within and a video director. And he defined VR as the first medium that makes the jump from our internalization of the artistic expression to our experiencing it firsthand. So it's this, you know, obviously this firsthand experience. So with you guys working in VR, how have you found that this fact has um, affected creative decisions? Um, I, I, I both agree and disagree with, with that, with what he said. I think um, the creator can create uh, um, an experience that will, uh, that, the, that the, the, the viewer or the, the, the person is going to experience, but it's not, the person is not necessarily experiencing the creation of that. Uh, but although I think that, that this is a possibility in VR though, that we could show, we could create project where we see the evolution of a project and it's maybe even more interesting to do that in VR than it is uh, as a traditional form. I mean, making of our, our fun, but if you have that, that feeling of being there while the creation is happening, I think this is something that, that could be very interesting and very interesting for uh, uh, as an education tool where you can maybe get people closer to the, the, the creation process. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm probably a little weird in the sense that you, I've worked pretty heavily with technology and especially with the VR stuff, but I, I'm somewhat skeptical about a lot of it, um, at least the application of it, especially when it comes to um, education in general. But I think that... Uh, I take a lot of the like the, I know that TED talk you're talking about. I, I watch it and I and I try to stay up to date with a lot of stuff. And I take a lot of that stuff a little bit of a grain of salt because a lot of people that are presenting a lot of these ideas uh, are are really pushing it and promoting it. And generally, it's coming from a place where lots of dollars are involved. So. It's not to say that they're right or wrong. It's to say that some, in some ways, the motivation's a little skewed. I think that's just my opinion. But um, there's just not enough research and evidence yet about how it affects 
the things we're talking about. Like, I think there's this weird psychological idea of trying to create some sort of tangible experience, but with completely synthetic things. Mm -hmm. um, I think psychologically that's strange. Um, it, it sort of just doesn't jive, I think, with, uh, with, with your mind. Yeah. So I think there's always going to be some weird disconnect. Yeah. Um, you know, what you see, like if you walked out of the VR village or, or any of the other examples of what everybody's trying to do with VR now, it's tracking, head tracking, physically grabbing objects in the scene and all these other things. And, you know, now you have gloves that have sensors. And you, so there's this like push to have this completely immersive, tangible thing. Um, creating as more real as you can. So how does that connect us as educators to what we're really doing in the classroom? How does it, how, is that going to be better than actually literally grabbing some clay and moving it around? I don't know. I don't know what, how that's going to be connect. So I'm fascinated with that basic concept in general. Um, is it going to be a tool uh, that helps us tell stories better? I don't know. I don't know yet. I haven't really seen anything like that um, yet. So I think, yeah, it's a yes and no kind of thing. I think there's a lot of question marks yet and see how it, uh, there's still a lot of stuff, um, how it affects what we do and how it affects people in general, um, creatively and otherwise. So I don't think there's a real clear answer to any of that yet. In, in the specific um, projects that you've worked on with yeah. VR, has, how has it been different with the creation of it? Is it different at all? when you're creating either content or? I, the, the fundamentals really aren't that different. So the skill sets you need to be an artist or an animator are, are pretty much the same. So, uh, you know, um, that's, that's never really gonna change no matter what happens with the technology. You know, we, I've, I've been through, probably most of, most of us here have been through um, when computer graphics were incredibly arcane that if you wanted to do anything that was remotely artistic, you had to type a line of code. Right. So as a, a, a trained visual artist that had no tech background at all in the beginning, that whole thing was just, you know, you're like, as artists, you want it now, you want it immediately. Um, that's become a little easier, more accessible. We can do things quicker, but there's still a disconnect. There's still wait and see kind of thing. So, um, um, I don't, I don't know, so that beginning of it has, has really hasn't changed, but I think the biggest part of, technically speaking, is the multitude of uh, complexity that VR adds in, in, the, in, the, in the creative process. So we, whether we have a fully CG immersive environment or whether we have these uh, linear sort of uh, uh, video things, we still have the process of, of putting all that stuff together. So the, the infrastructure of doing all that is still really, really heavy and cumbersome from a creative standpoint. Oh, yeah. interesting. The, that was the interesting thing of, of that project working with Sandy is that in the end we had to do some compositing simply because of, of Sandy's limitation that are based on the fact that the software is pretty old and you know doesn't handle the alpha channel really well or things like that. But, um, but most of it really could be done in it. Uh, by an artist yeah. that is that is drafting, drawing in it, and animating directly in the software, and and to for me because of a, a lot of the creators that we're working with that are not, you know, they're not programmers. They don't want to script something. They they want to feel what they're working on. They want to have the visual feedback really quickly. Uh, we're doing indie short film, so it's a. Uh, um, the process has to be easier. And, and game engines are fantastic. We do have VR project in, in Unity or Unreal, and, but you need, you need a team, you need programmers, you need animators, uh, you need a lot of people are going to put that together and, and spend months debugging it and optimizing it. Um, I'm not saying that's not okay. I think there's a lot of experience that need that. <laughs> But I think one of the potential of VR is to get people to uh, even develop new art form by just giving them tools that they can start creating directly with, you know, and, and almost 
almost in an organic way. I don't. It doesn't make any sense for the mm -hmm. VR, but it's you know very, very touchy feeling drawing directly in space. So I wanted to get back to what Caleb was saying before about the psychological disconnect. Were you talking about that from the artist's point of view or the creator's point of view or the audience members? Just in general, oh. it's it's just inherent in 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 this whole the, the VR idea, right? It's inherent in it. So, and I don't think there's really again, I don't think there's enough uh, evidence yet on on really having a a sound sort of theory about it. But I I think it's there's. Uh, you know, it's the whole idea that, that there's with technology. There's always something a little lost, right? So you have the creator, then you have the spectator, and then how is there a direct connect connection there? What's the interpretation of it? Uh, and especially if you have a situation with with VR, we have this unlimited 360, uh, 360 degree view of whatever you're doing. Um, again, there's a struggle for interactivity in the environments versus, you know, just showing a picture that the person can look around at. Um, and so I think it's it's still somewhat nebulous of, of how that's all going to work with the, would you agree? I mean, oh, yeah. it's somewhat totally. nebulous how that's going to work for a spectator or, or a student or um, anybody that's going to put themselves in those environments and how that's going to uh, connect with them. The, there are things that you think will work and then you try it and you realize it just doesn't work right. at all. And there are things that you feel, okay, this, uh, I don't know why that works but it does like right. uh, this thing again this film it's abstract it's absolutely not realistic it doesn't ref reflect the real world at all but you feel present in there but at the same time and that was one of the very in very interesting thing with that piece is that you don't ask yourself okay who am i in that world you could be a speckle of dust you could be anything you don't you just don't ask that question you just have that fantastic trip and that's it. And that's fun. And that's one of the things that, you know, that's one of the things that animation is good for, too, is that we can create world and animation that, that don't have to be realistic, even though we've been trying for years to push it to high level of realism. But why? I mean, we can create some, some crazy, crazy, fantastic things with that. And, and VR, why not? You know, maybe let, let's use animation to create world that have no possibility of existing in real world. Yeah, I think there's like, I mean, again, I think it's too early to tell how it's really going to be implemented and and, and be an everyday use kind of tool in the classroom. Um, for, you know, now we're, now we're, if you look at desk uh, uh, laptops, right? So, you know, most students have laptops and things like that. But um, you have one end of the simplicity of maybe an art history class where instead of showing a student a picture of the Mona Lisa, you actually have them walk through the Louvre and go to that painting and then see it in scale. And is, is that experience virtually um, better? Or is that experience just as good as being there? I don't know. I don't think anybody really has that answer yet. Well, you I could, think that's you could kind touch of the, the Mona Lisa in VR. You can't touch it if you yeah. actually go to the Well, <laughs> good point. Yeah, but, but they, they but would then, feel that it's very small, a lot smaller yeah, than they It's like it this was. big. I was actually looking at the painting behind the Mona Lisa. Uh, <laughs> well, there was a line waiting to get the Mona Lisa. I was looking at this huge. Thing. But um, but yeah, but they, uh, but that's a good point. But touching is it touching? So I mean, what is is there real? I mean, you see what I mean? So it's. Um, We'll see where it goes. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical about it. But Well, so much about what we teach, at least in, in schools that teach filmmaking, is about this you know, aspect ratio and, and what, how you compose for the screen to get the audience to look in a certain direction. And of course, VR blows a lot of that out of the water. Where, right. you know, how do you imagine or how do you compose for a screen in VR? Yeah, it becomes a world. You're, yeah. You know, I mean, uh, I think it, it, from the standpoint of like game development, right? Uh, a, a big part of game development is you know completely 3D environments, and you're creating worlds. Um, you you have a story, you have characters, and and you're putting those characters and that story within a world. And now there's uh, you know there's degrees of confining the size of the world. Um, in some cases, there's not. So. Um, from that standpoint, VR makes a lot of sense um, that now you're immersing yourself literally in that, you know, more figuratively in that world. Um, so the story from a game development standpoint doesn't necessarily 
change other than being really fully immersed in it. Um, uh, at least change drastically, it can change subtly in certain ways. But as far as telling a linear story, um, you, where you're forcing the viewer to kind of go where you need the viewer to go, um, I don't know, there's a lot of stuff that's coming out pretty soon that, uh, that people are working on that will probably tell us a little bit about that. Um, uh, this, this silly picture that you guys got of me in there, that's actually a, a camera rig that was used on a film called, uh, that's coming out, Suicide Squad. And so they did a bunch of VR things with that camera rig. Um, I saw some of the stuff. Um, it's pretty interesting. Uh, but again, it's, you're, you're, you're not really uh, dictating the action. You're following along. You can look anywhere you want, but the action is, uh, is already predetermined kind of thing. So I don't know how that's really going to play out. Yes? Yeah, I uh, just want to report that the kids we had at Sunday State University where um, we had a three days, uh, three day intensive workshop with young people from uh, Google's online store. Mm -hmm. We would produce like all the RPs, but we uh, at the last day, uh, which is something that seems simple, but it really worked. How to, I'm just talking to what you said, how to compose a piece for VR. What he did, he, he brought, he made the students make a rea reality viewer instead of a VR. It was a reality viewer, which was basically just a cardboard <laughs> box that looked kind of like. Um, uh, you know, it, it would get away your um, peripheral vision. Yeah. yeah. And there's a little gap for the nose. <laughs> and, uh, and then the students improvise. They, they create a story, and they someone would be in the middle, and the story would be happening all around. They create like a, a little storyline, much to improv. And then and they didn't know where that person would be looking at. And then they came up with like, Figures and how to attract the, the viewer to that point, or how to wait, the action would wait. And a lot of like really technology storytelling techniques for this. It was so interesting. We had like the you know, 10 different stories created that day, and, and then we sat and came up with a whole bunch of rules for how this story would work in an environment where you don't control. The viewer, mm -hmm. and that's kind of. I think it was really nice to just play with improv. So I, I just wonder, maybe theater will uh, have a bigger role. Absolutely. In uh, in creating stories yeah. more than just storyboarding. You can start sure. from storyboarding, but then you would uh, really play with this space as a way to bring story to you. Well, that's one thing we found out is that storyboarding doesn't really work in huh. VR. <laughs> uh, or maybe it's because of, unless you, I guess, unless you storyboard in VR, uh, maybe that's something. Again, that a, a software that makes it possible to sketch really quickly might, might help, where you can put set up lights and you can organize the action a little bit. But there are, there are tools, cinematic tools, traditional cinematic tools that, that still are useful. I mean, lighting uh, a scene uh, to attract, you know, sp specifically the attention of somebody, that's, that's an old trick and it still works in VR. It might be a little bit different, but it's still something we'll use. Uh, uh, you said technology in order to trigger action, obviously in a, in a game engine, in some, it could be a linear story, but the story is not going to happen until the person is actually looking in that mm -hmm. direction. That's that's uh, obviously something. Yeah, I think when you, with any technology, especially new technology, I think most people have a tendency to overthink it, right? You know, I, and, and I always tell my students don't overthink. <laughs> and I think with uh, with VR storytelling, you, you could use the same basic principles of uh, any developing any story. I mean, you have locations, you have characters, you have you know uh, conflict, whatever those cases may be. Um, and you can drive yourself or walk yourself to whatever those particular points are um, and then be motivated by some particular action. And if there's a multitude, of, I mean, it's kind of limitless, limitless from that standpoint, but fundamentally the, the storytelling ideas are pretty much the same. You know, it just depends on where you're at and what's happening at that particular time. 
uh, uh, questions in the here. In the, here. Yeah, just quickly, um, you mentioned disconnect, and I was just thinking about VR in the classroom as a tool. Right. I think just going around here today, it's, it's a very isolated, yes. uh, solitary mm -hmm. experience. Yes. And I think when you're in a classroom environment, you're going to lose the connection with your fellow students, instructor somehow. You know what yes. I mean? You, you can get lost. I agree. Physically, you know what I mean? That's what I think is a big challenge. I agree. What I think that that's all part of sort of where I'm coming from with the basic right. idea is like, okay, there's this fundamental goal of trying to make a connection with the technology, right? So try to make it sort of tangible. Maybe it's tangible. I don't know yet kind of thing. Uh, there's also uh, uh, VR applications where they have uh, people that are, there's, you know, you're in the same world, you have multiple glasses and you're tracking and all that kind of thing too. Again, it's an effort to try to make a connection. Um, how that will work and what you're talking about, I'm not sure. Uh, um, I'm, again, I'm skeptical of, of that, but I agree with you. I think um, I'm, I come from the school, we call it old school or whatever, but in the classroom, the more, uh, the more you can, no matter if we're doing digital stuff or not, the more you can make a connection to something tangible, the more likely the student is going to grasp hold of it and, and retain it. Um, and we struggle with that from my world, from doing games and digital stuff, because we're always behind this box, right? So coming up with ideas and techniques to, to uh, get them away from the box at, or, or experience something tangible and make that connection is a difficult one, but it's an important one from my standpoint, from an ed educational standpoint. So. I, I, I agree with you. We'll see what happens. One way I saw it used in, in school, and I thought it was really interesting, is to get one kid in, with a VR headset that is reporting what he's seeing to the other kid. Oh. And then they can, you know, they can change place. But that seemed to be very effective. You do like little five minute, seven minute experience like that. And that was really, really, uh, I think, uh, good to retain the information and learn and exchange on what they see. Um, AR has potentially more potential in the classroom uh, by far. Do you have to define AR? Well, think... we, we have this project that we were working on uh, at the NFP, uh, and the whole idea since we work on that is to create those ha ha moments for people that we experience. Say ha ha uh, or uh, ha ha. ha, ha. <laughs> like, like this, this, yeah, this, this ha -ha like very, ha -ha. very, you know, moment where you're just like, okay, mind blown. This is, ha. this oh, is. Oh, you mean uh, like an Oprah thing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, we're trying to, to show how the brain works. And then we, we went into a place like um, the MNI, the, the Montreal Neurological Institute, and we you know, experienced things uh, that were like, oh my God, this is fantastic. How can we share that experience? And, and all along we've been thinking VR, VR, okay, this, this, is, this is a great way to do it. But at the same time, we want the experience to be really personal. We want, we want the person to learn about their own brain, not somebody's brain that you know, was studied. 10 years ago. Um, and we realized doing, well, especially when we got uh, Microsoft HoloLens to, to experiment with, that AR is very interesting because it, you stay connected to your real world and you add to it. You, you enhance it with something more. Uh, and I think in classroom, this is going to be fantastic. So the A in AR stands for? Uh, augmented reality. Augmented. So, so you you create a, you create a world like in VR, but instead of completely isolating you in a, in a different world, you merge your real world with right. with more information right. or more detail, and you can you can be you, you can you can be very you know add a, just a little something that's going to be on your table, or you can create a whole world that people are going to to look at. You can you can think the hollow do deck, a lot. Basically. Like yeah. yeah. Uh, but it makes it's a lot easier to create experiences that are going to be shared uh, in AR than in VR. Uh, you know, I was thinking of this gentleman's comment about the classroom and you know needing the interaction. But after listening to Eloa, it's you know I, I guess our goal in the classroom is to spark every independent student independently as well. So you know I think this is putting them in their exact experience they need to be in for that kind of inspiration as well. Interesting. I think we've got a question way in the back. Okay. He's had his well, um, about, <laughs> Thanks, Lee. Uh, isolated in virtual reality. If you could have a situation, for instance, students who have learning disabilities who are easily distracted, 
So maybe it's not the appropriate thing to use during class time, but during a tutoring time or something like that. And I just wonder if it's true a lot of it's unproven, but as you have to try it and work with it to start discovering what the applications are. Mm. Oh, absolutely. And I think that's I think that's part of what you know, I'm a big proponent of that. I think there's there's gotta be some experimentation. But I, I think the, the my my experience with everything as far as education goes, I mean, outside the entertainment aspect of it, I think the entertainment aspect of it is easy. Um, you know, there's a lot of money behind it. You can figure things out. Let's, you know, what's going to make it more exciting? I think that's the easy part. It's the other stuff that's a little bit more difficult in how and what you're talking about. I think, uh, you know, the idea of um, having some underprivileged uh, kids or, or whatever experience something they would never be able to experience any any other way I think there's possibilities there and there's lots of research that's being done in that field as well um, yeah no it should all be experimented and tried in, in, for sure absolutely I'm a big proponent of that and um, but again you know time will tell on the actual imp implementation of it and the infrastructure of actually making that really accessible you know that's the, that's the big key Right. Right. Exactly. Uh, plaid, plaid shirt, and then black shirt, and then flower shirt. <laughs> we'll, we'll come back here to eat. Related to the VR thing. First of all, VR is a little unique in that you know, there's not many communal VR experiences yet, mm -hmm. but you can be together and still isolate. Right. Right. Uh, but in a good way, as in, uh, if you look at some of the early research that's being done, the emotional level of engagement for better or worse in VR is extremely high, much higher than just a 2D screen game in a very simple So when you compare, when you add that level of engagement with the ability to have multiple people in one shared space, I think that can actually be pretty interesting. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and then, we have a studio in Montreal, uh, Minority VR, that have been working on. They they're not working on that specifically, but they've been uh, thinking about uh, what bullying in VR will be uh, specifically for that. And this, I mean, it's a it's a real possibility. Yeah, I, I saw an example at uh, GDC uh, in the Dallas conference back in March. Uh, and I forget the name of the game, but two of you play it. And you walk in and you're in some abandoned tomb somewhere, right? And you see the avatar of the other person walking next to you, and they see you. What you don't realize is that that's just a projection. They're already off in a completely separate corridor to the one you're walking down within the game. But they think you're walking next to them, and you think they're walking next to you. And then they do something really horrible to the other player. <laughs> and the impact on the person that's playing the game is really quite. I think you, I, you hit on something really, I think, really important, uh, sort of the emotional experience or the positive emotional experience, because there is a lot of, re there is some research, uh, pro probably a lot of research about uh, VR and uh, research with phobias and things like that. And that was done in the early 90s, in the early stages of, of VR. And so I think, and there's some stuff, some of that's starting to kind of come back and research uh, with that. And I think that's a really, really, that's a good positive step uh, for for the educate for educational purposes, where you have a lot of students students that may have some emotional uh, development issues, things like that, that could be beneficial for sure. Absolutely, yeah. And black shirt. And black shirt and then blue shirt. Yeah, with the that, I also have a problem with lighting because I have been doing some cabin VR session in Seattle, and we were teaching as much as training for forty eight hours of work, and uh, it's actually pretty good because. You can have a screen on the side where you can see where the, the viewer is looking at as much. So that's basically the way I would. As much as you can basically give the sound to the viewer. So you can have a classroom looking at what the guy do as much as you can play in scenes and basically communicate with him. Mm -hmm. And uh, in my, my studies, at some point in mathematics, I remember that, that we had an exercise very much to in mathematics, which was basically going to the board. And you have no draft. You have to do your draft in front of the teacher. And that was almost the strongest stuff I've ever had in my education, in my education because that's where I learned the most because the teacher was seeing my processing. Mm. Tell me, mm. um, oh, you don't believe in yourself enough, uh, you were you are doing some this kind of stuff. And those were huge, let's say, life lessons, and I think we can do that in VR now. Mm. 
because with VR, we can see how the people are behaving, what are the brains of the people, what are, what are they looking, how they are thinking. That, that's both interesting and scary at the same time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, there's already like lots of training that's already been done in medical fields and, and military, and this, so that's already been applied pretty extensively, and it's developed pretty strongly. So, uh, why we wouldn't be able to develop those kinds of ideas and what we do, I, I think, is you know, it's why one, not? You know, why one not? of the next step that will make VR a lot more. Uh, comfortable and, and believable and interesting is the, is the eye tracking uh, and that's going to allow for technologically for a lot of things remove motion sickness and things like that but this eye tracking means that the game maker or the person creating the experience will be able to see what you're looking at how long and how often and and uh, I mean there's a lot of questions we should ask ourselves too uh, about how much information we want to share uh, <laughs> My question comes back to like the storytelling aspect and not being able to storyboard. <clears throat> I'm originally a video editor, and so I'm very used to compressing time mm. and animation. You always probably do that, but that doesn't seem to work in VR as much. How, to, how does that change? Just compress time because theatre obviously is more another that's another analogy to VR maybe than. That, well, that's true in theater, but in theater they also compress time, but they find ways, tricks to to do it by you know the uh, the way characters exit, uh, the the change in lighting. Uh, there there are uh, uh, in in Minotaur the, the 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 animation work because it's it's uh, forward motion all the time, uh, which which also oh, help with motion sickness. Uh, it, it allows you to look around, but you know that what's happening is in front of you. But we have these devices where, where the, the character, let's call it the character or the user, move from, from one world to the other, and it, it's just a very simple transition to, uh, to one event to another event. And in a way, it's a form of editing and, and, and compression uh, of time. Uh, the, the experience is seven minutes, and in that seven minutes, we go through the whole experience of the, the Euro journey. So I think it's a, it's a question of finding, tr you know, tricks. Uh, but theater is probably a very good example. It might that. be similar to the film Rope, the Alfred Hitchcock film Rope. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, I think, with no cuts. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, but with, with with like game development or game designers, uh, I think it's it's similar. Again, a lot of the, the the fundamental techniques of storytelling and theater are used. I, I don't see why um, any of that couldn't be incorporated in VR. You 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 can force a player or, or uh, participant in a direction with all these particular tools. And I'm still not convinced that cut don't work. Uh, I still think that yeah. that there might be and there's got to be a way to do it. One one way to do it and in, is in, in it has to be in an interactive project, but uh, you can use the teleportation time to actually do that. Uh, so so th I, I still think that there are ways to in, insert cuts, but uh, but yeah, it needs to be experimented. Yeah, you have space. So if you do that in the space, you're actually in. Yeah, you have to be very careful, but that's a lesson we learned when we were doing stereoscopic movie, to make sure that uh, that where your eyes, the, the viewer's eyes were focusing, is going to match. Convergence. Uh, con yeah. yeah, in the next in the next shot. So, so the direction that that you're not going to face a wall suddenly or something, uh, when when you when you after the cut. Don't know when the person watching. Well, there are ways around that. Uh, I, again, it's easier in an interactive project where you can, if you know where the person was looking at, you can orient the room for the next cut in a way that will make sense for the rest of the story and avoid problems. But uh, for a linear film project, it's, uh, it's a different story. We have another question. Hmm. It was just, and it's not so much a question, but I was just thinking of film and educators for that view. The first time I heard about VR, I wasn't more concerned about like, oh my God, what software <laughs> is that I'm gonna use? You're gonna have that right. software. It, like it's hard enough to just have it, like a regular lab <laughs> sure. mm -hmm. in a public school, like where I be. So, um, but I think like from our experience, experience with uh, Google Spotlight Stories, what I took it out of there is that there is so much we can do with students on the conceptual level. For example, if 
you want your viewer to have agency over this story, or how much agency the viewer can have, or how direct, how much of the story structure you wanna keep, uh, you know, like really structure, or how you know you wanna just structure. There's so many things we can do at that level, and what I love, I think the best way to think about it as an educator is to problem solve just with that, those questions, because I think that's all, all these students that I know and all people that I mean, just that's what they're doing. Solving problems yeah. and coming up with a story or not different ways to tell a story. And that's a great time to be a teacher, I think, because the outer rules are not set yet. So you can kind of sit with them and, and start thinking about it and come up with new ideas instead of just teach what we already know. So yeah. you can kind of like learn through them. I, I was just thinking, you know, that yeah, probably right. the be best approach instead of focusing so much on the software and technical. I, stuff. I, I agree 100%. Yeah. Technology is, when technology becomes cumbersome, mm. it's useless. Mm. And, and when it becomes cumbersome in the classroom, it's even more useless. Um, you know, updating a driver and all this stuff. So, and as from, from an art, uh, an art uh, educator standpoint, again, I go back to the whole idea is you want immediacy. We want, as artists, we want immediate gratification. Put some paint on a canvas, I wanna see it, this is what happens. Now we're dealing with computers in the digital world, uh, that immediacy is almost gone, right? And, we, there's, there's, and there's a disconnect again. Um, so battling that and creating some sense of that is, is, a, is always a challenge with technology, even, even as much as I've seen it grown and it advanced. It's still a challenge, you run into bugs and all these other things. So you end up, instead of totally focusing on the creative, you end up becoming uh, a little bit of an IT person too. You've yeah. got to kind of know your way around that, right? Um, when when it, it's becoming more and more direct and from a creative standpoint, but when it be, until it becomes immediate, as immediate as grabbing some clay and pulling it around, mm -hmm. we're always going to struggle with these issues. And, and VR, from that standpoint, at least in the classroom, VR is in its infancy mm -hmm. from that standpoint. It's in its infancy. Um, and it's, it's going to grow rapidly. It's going to develop rapidly. But will it get to a point where um, they're dropping off a box with glasses in the classroom and we just stick it and press a button and we're going, oh, this is what we're going to do? I don't know. I don't know. It's it, just a matter of uh, uh, how much money, how much time, and who's involved kind of thing. Well, given that, um, if if any educator wants to start VR in their program, what would they need? What what are the foundations? Uh, you can start with a very cheap 360 camera, and, and already, okay, some people will argue it's not really VR because it's not stereoscopic and blah blah blah. But you can just start really really basic, uh, like a Theta S camera or something 360. It's, it's low resolution, I agree, it's not the best experience, but it's enough to understand the principle and to try storytelling and then see what works and what doesn't work. And the student will, will learn probably more from what doesn't work than what, from what works. So, so just trying, testing stuff. Uh, you can try pixelation uh, uh, with a camera, a 360 camera. You can try uh, and, see, and see what comes out of that. Uh, and then there's After Effects. Uh, with uh, with a plugin that that does uh, you know use QMap that makes it possible to have a, to have a, a 360 render. Mm. Uh, that's also an easy way to just you know go from Photoshop to to After Effect and create something fairly quickly. Unity, uh, which mm. probably a lot of Obviously. people use, we use it at, on our campus uh, with very powerful uh, uh, game development or game uh, tool. Unity is. You'll probably see it on the floor if you look around. A lot of people are using it with Oculus and that kind of thing. So um, there's still some tech kind of involved in making that work. Um, but it's a f relatively speaking, it's a fairly inexpensive step into that world. Uh, um, and you could, you don't really necessarily need to uh, go out and film via yeah. with cameras. You can create 3D content uh, with an Oculus and then be able to do some 
some VR uh, that way. You'll see some examples of that on the floor. One way is to have a template already made uh, in Unity and, and student can import content and map it on, on Surface right. and, and test that quickly. I remember when I got the, the first Oculus uh, DK1, uh, one of the first experiences I downloaded was, uh, I have to find the name of that person because I talk about that story often, but uh, it, that, it's a father that just scanned the drawing of his four or five year old daughter and basically put them in Unity, mapped them on a surface, mm -hmm. and he created you know, the environment, the little animals and characters she had created, put some basic behavior so, you don't, so they don't collide to each other and mm -hmm. you don't run through them. Really, really simple. And it was really fantastic. It, it, was, it, was, it was very immersive. It was, it was a fantastic experience to be in that little girl world in our mind and see those little characters around. And really, it probably took him two or three hours of work max to do the whole thing. Yeah. Um, um, we got one in the back, back here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm sorry, black shirt here in the middle. <laughs> um, my last year in university, I worked on a project of uh, immersive educational experiences. And I have a background in 3D Studio with uh, V-Ray. And at first, I was using Dome Master with mm -hmm. V-Ray. And that didn't work too well because I know V-Ray materials better. And they found out that theory answers, copying and things like that. But still, my workflow is super long. And eventually, because of my time frame and you know, I have to graduate, I realized that <laughs> I could make something quite simple, quite immersive using Illustrator. Uh -huh. And uh, then import that to Premiere and then give it 360 minutes out of YouTube. It's very touch and go. Have it on cardboard. Have it all on Great. the website. And Absolutely. It like the simpler, the better. See, I see, see here's a good yeah, as you're saying that I'm seeing faces go <laughs> <laughs> not not that what you did was wrong but but I understand exactly what you're saying he understands exactly what you're saying but there's probably a lot of people in this room that have no idea what you're talking about and so I think that's a really good thing in the sense of or, or understanding sort of the disconnect of the simplicity of actually applying the technology in the classroom right so um, that's why I mentioned about, you know, you sort of have to become this techie kind of IT guy, uh, no matter what your particular field is or the educator is. As an artist, I, I've been around long enough that I kind of know the techie stuff, right? Um, but we hope that we don't have to do that, right? I figured out this and I go, to, you know, you know what I mean? So um, how that's going to happen is yet to be determined, you know? Um, if you take the, I, I, I probably some people are going to hate me for this, but the iPhone's a great example, right? Um, there's a reason why my three-year-old daughter can pick up the iPhone and go like this, and knows how to do it. It's brilliantly designed. The design of the interface and how it works, and the, just the, the that concept of that simplicity is genius, right? Now, those ideas from a design standpoint, software and otherwise, and technology applied to the VR, that's what it's going to take. Mm. That's what it's going to take to really have an impact in the classroom from, from, from elementary school to collegiate. You know, so. I don't know how to run things. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Question here? Uh, I'm not an educator, but um, I produce training content for uh, medical mm. device companies. Mm. But I, um, I'm wondering in the undergrad or in the formal education system if there's a trend towards. When I was an undergrad, we had a design lab because the, the workstations weren't powerful enough, but that's not going to have everybody have one. But is there any sort of labs that are developing for like VR, you know, situational training in the undergrad environment that you guys are familiar with where people can. Students can go in and actually access content that way. There, I mean, what schools would have a VR lab? Yeah, in terms of, um, I look at it like a platform the same way the computers were back in the 90s. That still, in order to have a full experience, they have to have a machine and a keyboard and all that kind of stuff. Next session, everybody doesn't have. It's supposed to go from 1 to 150, the next one starts at 2. Okay, great, thank you. I didn't know if schools are creating labs where there are. You know, machines with the headsets that are available for students. Yes, there, there's, quite, so. a, there's yeah. quite a few institutions yeah. like that. Um, 
it, it varying degrees of complexity depending on the university or the system. Uh, the best thing for you really to do in that regard is just sort of search, you know, do the Google thing. Um, I mean, I know USC, I hate to, you know, USC has USC, a pretty, yeah. uh, pretty extensive program in their, uh, in, in Cal State Fullerton as Cal well. Cal State Fullerton's got a good one as well, yeah. yeah. We actually have to wrap it here, guys. Uh, please join the uh, ASIFA Hollywood Animation Educators Forum to continue the discussion. Thank you for being here. And thank you for our